school friend. Indeed, uh, when I went to India, I came back from India, I came back, we taught, a nice association. I used to write for his newspaper, the movement. He offered me $5,000 one time to do some, uh, something on an car, or he also gave me a free advertisement. I was a real, real, real nice guy. But guess what happened? In 1983, uh, three or four or five of his closest disciples defect. Now, they want to talk to me because they've seen what I did with Akinkar. They also know that I'm not necessarily so cynical. Like, I don't think all religion is crap. And they also know that we're friendly with John Roger. They also think I've been schnookered by John Roger. So they set up a private meeting in San Juan, California. And I'm invited. I go with a couple friends of mine. They start telling me horror stories about God. Now, this is all in press. It's in People Magazine, LA Times, a book, Life 102, which is subsequently this press. We're talking about that. It's all it's public, so I'm not going to say anything that hasn't been well mentioned at least. They claim that John Rogers had sex with his male heterosexual disciples, claiming that in order to get to the higher astral plane, they need to be, and pardon my language, they need to get divinely, rectally weaned in order to have aspects to a higher level. Now, I naturally get myself in lots of trouble because I said, oh, my son, my God, I said, he sounds like a divine love ranger. <laughs> it's not politically correct, and I all, I'm the guy who will say it. But I like John Roger. I mean, we were friendly. He was friendly. Did I think he was a mystical traveler of consciousness for 25,000 years? Do I think he was the second closest thing to Jesus? No. I thought he was a scam from day one. But he was a nice guy, and therefore I'm not really in the mood to start exposing people because I'm not really it's ironic. It looks like I'm about to expose that. It never happens. It always happens by default. It always comes to me kind of it's almost like the Godfather 3. They keep pulling me back in. So, in this case, <laughs> in this case, I called John Roger on the telephone. And John Roger knew that I had an association with the spiritual group in India. We were friendly and everything. But John, he claimed that you have $250,000 of gold kilograms under your bed to impress your lovers. Moreover, you pick a male disciple every night to have sex with them. You claim that you're not really in the body, but you're floating in the higher astral plane. But the one guarding your body should have sex with it unless a psychic entity takes over your body. I mean, unbelievable stuff. And his friendly tone immediately changed. It became real nasty. And I didn't really want to, I told him, I don't really want to write this thing, you know. But he got real nasty. Eventually what happened is he sets up a, a coalition for civil and spiritual freedom, a P.O. box in Bustle's area. Start sending out smear death that I've attributed to John. Right? Other people have attributed to disaffected members who are trying to manipulate me. Whatever. We'll get up, we'll get up. But I start getting death threats. They say, David Lane, the widower, David Lane, scumbag, we're going to kill so and so, things are going to happen. Now, I wasn't going to write this freaking article. I had no desire to until they started coming after me. So I said, hey, you can't do that. So I write a fairly critical called the J.R. Controversy in 1984. But I didn't expect to be robbed on October 5th of 1984, four months later. I come back and teach at UCSD and get my PhD and come home. I'm home to Del Mar, walk into my apartment, walk in, places, lands. Telephone wires have been cut, all my dissertation research gone, video teams gone, mm -hmm. things. I'm thinking, oh man, what did I do, man? Did I not do the dishes? <laughs> she pissed at me, man, what did I do now? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of everything like that. And I look, and there's a big note that says, no more. And it's on these articles in the John Roger Carters. Channel 8 News comes out. Cult leader been ransacked and robbed by, you know, you know all that stuff. I mean, research. So I don't know who did it. I think it's Akin Carr. It could be John Roger. I, you know, I know, a lot of people don't like me very much. Eventually, what happens is Akin Carr, a year later, gets a bunch of stolen property sent to them anonymously. I my wife's diary with handwritten notes. Acting card, knowing we've had some legal battles before, doesn't want to touch stolen property. They send it immediately to my attorneys. My attorneys give it to me. We go through it. We take it to handwriting analysis. This has been certified. The handwriting analysis, nobody else made notes of this, is John Roger Hankins. His handwriting notes. And he, at the same time, on November 17th of 1984, he writes me a personal letter. It was day by day, sir. I want to be friends. <laughs> On the same day, he sends a letter to India. I have this document. It sends a letter to India saying that this guru comes to India and will sue you unless you stop David Lane. On both letters, 
and also the third letter, which was sent by the guys who robbed the house, there's a malfunction in capital A, which we, you know, traced it back. Now that's what I call it. So I write an article called The Criminal Activities of John Roger Higgins. I go on TV, right to the camera, and said, John Roger Higgins robbed my house. He doesn't sue me. Geraldo gets in. <laughs> I know, he gets mad, he gets mad. He's the bottom to this thing. He calls me, and he had a show, the upscale Geraldo show. It wasn't the bad one. It was called Now It Can Be Told. I don't know if you remember this. Derek, I think maybe I should have been. You should have brought that up. That's great. Yeah, it would have been classic. So Geraldo calls me on the phone. He wants me to be on the show because they're doing an expose on John Roger Hankins, the Cadillac of cults. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. You saw the guy with the rainbow tie. Oh, I've got that. That's right. So what happened was, they asked me to be on the show. I resisted. I want to be on TV as much as the next guy, but I resisted. So I finally get on the show, and I start talking about what John Roger Higgins did. At this time, there was an author named Peter McWilliams, a very famous author. He's written lots of books called Life 101. If you've been depressed, he has a book on depression. He was the one who wrote the TM book. Very famous with Harold Kim. He was a follower of John Roger But he defected right after the TV show. When he defected, he came to me. He was dead. John Roger had not been telling me the truth. Read your JR controversy. The LA Times did a huge two part article on it. People Magazine did something. So, all this stuff's coming out. Now, you can well imagine what John Ryder thinks about me, right? They don't like me very much. And I'm stuck in this position. I've only have written one or two articles on the guy, but extremely critical. And let's be clear, not very academic, very slim. I mean, I just came out, this is the way it is. Let's be real careful. Although it can be verified talk to tens and tens of people who've had sex with John Roger, and you can go verify the plagiarism for yourself, and you can go verify whether or not he's skirting tax laws. It was written in a very polemical style, kind of like the old you know, 19th century tracks of this guy's cult. So Peter McWilliams says, I want to write a book. I'm being sued by John Roger Hankins. I want to write a book. So he wrote a book, a very famous book, called Life 102, What to Do When Your Guru Sues You. <laughs> <laughs> and he writes this book, and you guys should remember this, the timeline is 1994, and Michael Huffington is running for oh, senator of California. His wife at the time, Michael Huffington later revealed that he was gay, and divorced his wife. His wife was Ariana Huffington. Ariana Huffington was a follower of John Roger Higgins. That's right. So Life 102 comes out, literally, I'm not making this up, changes the election. Because the nanny gate came out and the vote of 100,000 swayed, and Michael Huffington didn't become senator. This book by Peter McWilliams comes out. And it goes on TV, it's on the news, Vanity Fair, it's everywhere. Well, I was the most of the source for Peter McWilliams in the book. He's got a whole chapter about the robbery of my home, he even ends the book with the note. Remember the note, no more? That, that's photocopied at the very end of the book. No more. Oh. So I'm deeply involved again with John Roger Hayden. So the book sells, not greatly, but it sells pretty well. It has a huge influence, not only on the Senate race, but on John. It's, you get a chance, and even though it's written political, and even though it's written from a guy who's very anti-cult, it's extraordinarily funny, and it's deeply insightful. However, Peter McWilliams was in about, I don't know how many different lawsuits, because John Roger kept suing, 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 suing. Finally, Peter McWilliams went bankrupt. And when he went bankrupt, as you know, when it comes to lawyers, if you're being bankrupt, you might sell your soul for a little cash. So John Roger and his group offered him $2 million cash, provided, besides a couple of other things like paying back his royalty payment, provided he did one thing. You can guess what that one thing was. Sell back the copyright to Life 102, back to John Roger. Essentially, we don't want this book in the public eye. At the same time, Peter Williams had written me a letter saying, Dave, put Life 102 on your website. Anybody can put it on your website. So I put Life 102 on my website. A year and a half ago, John Rogers attorneys, MSIA, contacted me saying, take it off. We have the copyright to this book. I read it back, or whatever I did to my attorneys, and said, no, no, I have prior permission. I helped them write the book. Indeed, they're photocopying the note that you wrote. Actually, John, you do have copyright to that note because you wrote it, but I don't want to get into that. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, 
I have this letter, I have all this, you know, claim that, hey, Peter McWilliams in a deposition said I could not have written the book without David Lane. Indeed, I should have given him a royalty date, you know, all this stuff. But was it illegal leaves? You've got to be very careful. There's a thing called material consideration. If it's not done in material consideration, that is, I would have held otherwise, it's not considered material consideration. And therefore, the law has a tendency to protect the copyright holder, who is no longer Peter McWilliams. The copyright holder is MSIA and John Ryan. So we fight this. So I go to trial, go to court. They sue me. I have wife one two on my website. I'm being sued for copyright infringement. I, these people do not want me to read the book. And I'm thinking, the first man, we've got to do this. So we go back and forth. We try to settle a number of cases. Let's be careful. I like to dump on Peter McWilliams, sell my soul. For a moment, I was ready to sell my soul because when you get lawyers coming after you, you just want nothing to do with it. <laughs> Eventually, the legal bill, so you know, went up to a quarter of a million dollars. This lawsuit went to. So I'm like in the middle of this thing. At one point, we were going to settle. Right? I was going to take it off my website. That was kind of the argument. But I still wanted to fight it. So we fought it anyways. Went to trial. They loved this. And I lost. I mean, I lost. So I had to take my 42 off my website. And it's, no, it's been suppressed. But what's cool about it, it's still on. Because a woman in England or a guy in England copied the entire book, stuck it on their website. Now England has different copyright laws. Right. So even though they got me, they didn't get her. And so it's still on the internet. So if any of you, I think you should, of course you're a guy in two weeks, you're going to say you just had the Antichrist in class two weeks ago. Now, this raises a larger issue. The larger issue is that scholars, or you just even academicians, you get yourself in a big mess oftentimes. And it's not very clean for an academic, let's say, who claims to be an academic, to be in the midst of a lawsuit like this. But I love it, even though I lost. And I'm the first one to appreciate the court of law, because I understand that Peter McWilliams did indeed sign over his copyright. But it's a little depressing as an academician, because I know what's going on. They don't want you to have as much information as possible, pro or con. But, it does put you in an ironic situation where you sit there and say, well, wait a second. Is it coming to the place where religions can intimidate scholars to such a degree that they really can't tell the truth? They really can't come out? Always. It seems that way. It gets worse. You think I would you know, retire and just give this stuff up? I have a on my website called the top seven scumbag gurus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And so now number one, just so you know, I'm just not telling us it is. The reason I do this, by the way, is not because I'm not a scumbag myself. I would clearly not run for president of the United States because I make President Trump look like a good guy. But the point being is I don't claim to be God. That's, I don't make the transrational claim. And even if I did that, I'm fair game to. But what happened was, on my seven scumbag groups, number one was, so you know, it was Takar Singh, we talked about him a second. Number two was Saki Sai Number three was Duff Free John. Number four, I had John Roger. I mean, they didn't put him on top one. And then I had somebody like Chima and other people. And it gets people disturbed. But the reason I do it is because I'm basically saying these people are lying to their constituencies about their past. And I'm willing to confront it and say they're lying. Saki Sai Baba people, are not pleased. Six months ago, a couple of them from England set out a worldwide campaign on the internet, saying David Lane's website is homophobic, David Lane's website should be closed, shouldn't be supported by UCSD. Apparently, the president of India was contacted, UCSD was contacted, and then eventually what happened is the website, I've been hacked into, all my email, my hotmail was gone, 450, you know, people get upset. But let's be careful. I think it's fair game that if we're going to be critical of religion, that they can be also critical of back. I think that's fair. As long as it's a level playing field. That is, that is, that you don't resort to tactics that would otherwise border on criminal. 